My name is Stuart Butler. I am in charge of domestic research policy at the Heritage Foundation in Washington. And I've been taking part in the fiscal wake-up tour for the last three years because like the others on the tour, I am very, very concerned about the long-term unfunded obligations that are going to place a staggering burden on our children and grandchildren. Right now, we're a country that has had relatively low taxes and high growth for many, many years. For decades, we've had taxes between about 18% and 20% of our gross domestic product, in other words, the total economy each year. However, we now are facing a situation where because the baby boom generation is retiring over the next couple of decades, we're going to see spending on three major entitlements, Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid. And in the case of Medicaid, a lot of that is long-term care. We're going to see expenditures on those programs coming through the economy and through the federal budget like a tsunami, pushing all before it. If we were to try to keep our current level of taxes as a proportion of GDP at historical levels, and we were to accept a continuation of these large programs spending money, then within 30 years, every single penny raised in taxes would be used only for these programs. There would be nothing left, nothing at all, for other major expenditures of the federal government, such as roads, such as education, or defense. It would take everything. So really, when you think about the situation, we've really only got three choices. Choice one would be to say, let's just keep going as we're going today. And let's have huge deficits in the future because we keep spending the same on these three programs. And yet we do actually spend money on roads and education uh, and defense. So that would be one option. A second option would be to try to balance the budget in the future by raising taxes to such a level that they do pay for these three major programs and also uh, for other programs that we need. We could do that. A third option would be to actually look at these major entitlements, these programs particularly for the elderly, and say, can we reorganize and redesign them so that we can uh, assure people of a secure retirement and yet do so in an affordable way, which means that we don't have to have either big deficits uh, or high taxes. So what we've got to do now is have a real conversation about those options with the American people. The first option of just letting the deficit increase and the debt increase by just doing what we're doing today and keeping taxes down is really not an option at all. It would mean staggering debts on, our, on future generations. It would also mean that we'd have to continue to borrow huge amounts of money from other countries, particularly countries like China, that uh, we have to worry about whether they will start to force us to make changes in our foreign policy as a condition of continuing to bail us out over the next few years. And we'd have to be wor worried about the impact of our economy in any case if we have huge deficits and huge debt in the future in terms of what that means of interest rates, ability to have capital for new businesses, and so on. The second option, of course, is to raise taxes and other revenues so that we actually cover the obligations we've made in these entitlement programs and also pay for other necessary programs as well. The problem with that is that taxes as a proportion of our GDP would not just go up a little, they'd go up an enormous amount compared with what we've been accustomed to. In fact, over the next 30 years, if we were to do that, we would have to raise taxes as a proportion of our economy from roughly 19% today to about 30%. If you add on state and local taxes, that would be roughly 40% of our GDP each year would go in taxes. That's roughly what they have in Europe, and they've had a long record of slower growth and higher unemployment than we've had. If we were to have taxes at that level, what would it actually mean in terms of taxes that individuals pay? Well, if all of that extra revenue was to come from increasing tax rates in the federal income tax, and we did that across the board, well, then somebody on the lowest tax rate today, 10%, would be paying something like 17%. Somebody on the highest rate of 35% would be paying over 60%. That would be the kinds of changes that would, would have to be, and it would be mainly being paid by people in future generations, our children and grandchildren. 
That's the kind of tax rates that Americans have never accepted in the past, and I doubt very much whether they accept it in the future. In addition, we've got to be concerned that even if you send more tax revenue to Washington, is there any guarantee that Congress would actually use that to pay down the debt? Or would it, in fact, use it to fund new program programs, new promises in the future? Well, it turns out that in uh, the 2009 debate over, uh, over health care reform, a lot of ideas that we on the fiscal wake-up tour had been talking about as options in the future, from raising certain taxes to reducing certain spending in certain programs to bring the debt down, all of these were put forward as ways of partially financing a new entitlement in the healthcare area. So I think our experience should suggest that we should at least wonder very hard whether raising revenues would actually end up being used to deal with the problem itself. The third approach, of course, is to look at trying to deal with the entitlements themselves. Are there ways in which we can actually reduce spending on these programs and yet still have something that's fair and reasonable but affordable in the future? If we were to go down that road, it's still going to be difficult. And there are certain challenges we'd have to face. Number one is we'd have to change the basic incentives that Congress now has in terms of spending money. Today, Congress rarely looks beyond five years and never looks beyond 10 years in terms of what spending and deficits are really going to look like. So it's like having a credit card bill sent to you and all you look at, all you get in that bill is the next 10 minimum payments and, not, and the bill says nothing about your outstanding balance. That's really what Congress does. So the first thing we've got to do is change the incentives to get Congress to look at these things differently. In addition, it would be very important to change from these programs from being traditional entitlements to actually funded and budgeted long-term programs. That's going to be difficult. That means challenging the entitlement nature of these programs. And a lot of Americans will be very, very uh, distressed about doing that and resist it. So we've got to be serious that that's a tough step to take just to get the budgeting right. Then what are we going to do about the programs themselves? Well, to really uh, get these programs to be fair but more economically efficient, it seems to me that we would have to look at things like making these programs certainly stronger for people who are less fortunate, the really needy, and there are many holes in those programs right now, but at the same time as we're doing that, really cut back, save a lot more on people who really don't need these programs. So I think we need to look at adjusting the benefits and the cost, the premiums for things like Medicare, a little bit more towards uh, reflecting people's actual situation, their actual income and their need. That's not an easy step either. People who have paid into these programs all their life think of it as a right, which it is, a legal right. But the fact is that you can't discharge that right, give people all that uh, money and health care without burdening the future. And then finally, I think it's very important that we look at trying to boost savings uh, among people. That's not an easy thing to do either. But there are ideas like putting into place so-called automatic enrollment where people are automatically signed up for things like IRA accounts or 401k accounts to uh, give them more of a cushion when they retire. That requires people to do things differently than they're doing today. So it's not easy to get any of these changes put into place. But those are the kinds of things you'd have to do if you chose the option of trying to restructure and deal with these entitlement programs. On the fiscal wake-up tour, we've been going around the country telling Americans this kind of information, telling them what the facts are, telling them what the options are, and inviting them to talk to us about what they think is the right way forward, a kind of national family meeting between younger people and older people talking to each other and thinking through what the options are. I think that it's important now for President Obama and the leaders of Congress of both parties to do exactly the same thing, to have a national fiscal wake-up tour where the president and the congressional leaders go to cities like we've been doing, hold meetings, lay out the facts,
Show people exactly what's going on. Trust them to, with, the, with the information. Ask them what they think we should be doing, which options they think we should take, and the trade-offs. And then come back with guidance from the American people so that Congress can put into place the kinds of changes that are necessary. I think if they do that and get the backing of the American people in the way that we see support when we go out on the fiscal wake-up tour, I think if they do that, they will get the kind of political support and public support to make the tough decisions necessary so we end this outrage of a staggering, unfunded burden on our children and grandchildren. And the quicker we start doing that and take those steps, the better.